cataractcoach.com. Curriculum lesson number 25, Refractive Cataract Surgery, the final video in our curriculum series. Choosing refractive targets. Plano is not always best. Disclosure, I published cataractcoach.com, a free teaching website. So here's the patient, minus 12, minus 11 of myopia, two and a half of astigmatism. Let's do this cataract surgery. So here's my technique, phaco chop in the capsule bag, split the nucleus so we can remove it. Let's speed up the video. The nucleus and cataract removal goes well, no issues at all, clean up all the cortex. Time to insert the IOL. There's the lens going in the capsule bag, dialing it into the correct meridian. Here's the post-op. Torque lens, beautifully centered and rotated to the correct axis. It very nicely balances out the cornea. Post-op refraction, right eye, plano. Left eye, plano. That's perfect, right? Well, not so fast. We're right on target, but the patient's not happy. Why? Well, the patient wears contacts, under corrects his prescription. He walks around minus one with the contacts. Does his computer work all day long? And he doesn't really mind the blurred distance vision, except when he plays golf every Saturday. So we've made the patient happy now because we've given him these plus one computer glasses with the anti-glare tint. And then also he enjoys the Plano OU for golf and he's retiring this year and he anticipates playing a lot more golf. So we've had to explain to the patient that this is better for his future. Lesson one, mild myopia is a gift, especially for myopic patients who like to use it to enhance their near vision tasks like computer work. Here's our next patient, small eye, high degree of hyperopia. This is a tough one. The lens calcs come back with 30 or more diopters for the lens power. It's gonna be tough. So let's show you the surgery. We're gonna chop it in the capsule bag. This patient has a shallower anterior chamber, so we don't wanna prolapse it out of the capsule bag. So chopping goes great. Let's speed up the rest of the case here. We'll get through the rest of the nucleus removal. Remember, these hyperopic eyes are small. Make sure you make a sufficiently large capsular X, at least five millimeters, and chop in the bag so we can stay away from that shallow anterior chamber. Once that IOL goes in the eye, we'll dial it into position, and the patient should do well. Now, the lens calculations are tough because these small eyes are very difficult to determine where the lens will end up. What's the ELP, the effective lens position? And it's hard to determine exactly. So we went in doubt on these eyes, let's make sure we end up a little hyper. So if lesson two is hyperopes love distance vision. If they start out plus three or more, they'll love being plus a quarter, but will probably hate being minus a half. Our next guy walks in with this prescription. He says, I hardly wear glasses, I see okay. There's the pre-op refraction, he's got cataracts now. You say, let's aim for Plano with a toric lens. I can get this to perfect Plano. And you calculate it out. You'll get great distance vision, but loss of near. So remember, the conoid is going to be collapsed. Pre-op, there are two focal points. Post-op, it's going to be just that one Plano outcome. Increase the image quality, but we may decrease the depth of field. So here it is in plus sill. Let's convert it to a minus sill. Now it makes sense. At one axis, he has a zero prescription, and the other meridian, he's got a minus two. So those two focal points give him a very wide range of vision. So let's leave the patient with a minus one spheric equivalent and give him a non-toric lens. And now he's gonna be happy. And now we'll insert the non-toric lens with that minus one post-op goal. So very nice outcome for this patient. And our take home lesson number three, astigmatism can be okay. Some patients have what I call astigmatism of the brain and they prefer to see with more depth but less image quality. That's what they're used to. And our last patient, here we go. He says, I just can't see well enough. Time for some Google homework. And he figures out that he can get perfect vision and x-ray vision and be young again. And he says, I'll pay you whatever you want, but I want absolute perfection. Please, doctor. So we under-promise, and he says, okay, let's do the diffractive trifocal lens, and I can live with the compromises. Important, let's analyze his angle alpha, which is the distance between the visual axis and the optical center, and even more importantly, the angle kappa. That's the distance between the visual axis and the pupil center. You want those to be almost the same. In the picture right here, that's too far apart. This is a much better one. In this patient, the pupil center and the visual axis are nearly identical, optical center too. So now he's happy, I have a pretty wide range of vision without glasses. 
And the night vision glare and halos aren't too bad. Trifocal lens targeting, what do we want to target? Well, ideal goal is going to be Plano. If you end up myopic, even just a little bit, you probably won't be happy. You'll say the distance vision's blurry. So this is the perfection goal, Plano, Plano, Plano. But even if they end up a little hyperopic, it's better than ending up myopic. So he says, thank you, I'm so happy with the new vision. Life is good. So here we go. Faco chop in the capsule bag. This is his surgery. We're going to implant our trifocal lens. And the key here is, when you insert it, to line it up and center it with respect to the Purkinje images. The first Purkinje image is the reflection off the anterior surface of the cornea. That fourth Purkinje image is the flipped reflection off the posterior aspect of the IOL. Line both of those up with the visual axis. So lesson four, Plano to slight hyperopia for trifocal IOLs and choose patients with small angle alpha and angle kappa. Thanks for your attention, and you can have all 1,000 of my videos for free at cataractcoach.com. Incisional astigmatic treatment, the best option for low degrees of astigmatism. Disclosure, I own cataractcoach.com. Now, I like torque lenses. I use them every week, and they're best if the patient has one diopter or more of corneal astigmatism. But we're talking about low astigmatism here. For a high astigmatism patient, it's very easy to find the precise axis, and all your different machines give the same reading. So easy. But with a mild degree of astigmatism, less than one diopter, it's hard to find the precise axis, and all your different machines may give a slightly different answer. So the companies know this. In the USA, no matter the company, no company makes a toric lens that corrects less than one diopter at the corneal plane. The SN6, AT2, and ZCT100 are not available in the USA, and there's a good reason. And the reason is your phaco incision. So whatever size incision you do, it causes flattening. It has an astigmatic effect of 0.2 to 0.5 diopters, and that can vary among surgeons and among patients. So you can make our, your phaco incision on that steep axis, and since most cataract patients have against the rule of stigmatism, it's perfect for temporal. So here's a temporal incision, and we're making it about the 15 degree meridian, and that looks great. That's gonna cause flattening at that meridian. We can shift that incision also and pair it with an LRI, and that'll help also reduce the astigmatism. So at the end of your case, Lens in the capsule bag. Here I'm putting some triamcinolone in the anterior chamber, and we'll seal this up. We'll get a sponge soaked in tetracaine, and that's going to help give a little bit more anesthesia. Now we plan out the LRI according to clock hours. One clock hour is 30 degrees. Makes it very easy. You'll also notice that I'm using a fixation ring that's marked off in 30 degree increments or clock hours. So we put the fixation ring down here, and I can line it up, and I can determine where should we do the treatment. And there, we line it up exactly with the mark we want, put the LRI blade 500 microns deep, and we pass this. And you only need a small arc. That's just about all you need. At the end, check to make sure that it's totally sealed and watertight, and it dries up nicely. Looks beautiful. We have to aim for perfection. Here's post-op of the lamp, phaco incision plus the small limbal relaxing incision. Comfortable for the patient. They don't feel it. It doesn't tear up with the epithelium. The recovery is identical to just doing a regular cataract surgery. And this patient had about 0.7 diopters of corneal astigmatism, which was fixed very nicely by just the phaco incision and the LRI. So here's a very simple nomogram for an LRI. I learned it from Kevin Miller 20 years ago. It's a very good one. It works well. 500 micron depth blade. One clock hour of paired LRIs is about 0.7 diopters. So you can do two paired LRIs, or you can also do a phaco incision plus a single LRI, about the same net effect. Again, easy nomogram. You can do a paired incision to treat astigmatism. I have a full nomogram up on cataractcoach.com. It's totally free to access. And that helps you decrease the astigmatism as well. At the end of the case, the eye well is in the capsular bag. The eye is still full of viscoelastic. We'll line up the keratome now going nasally or opposite our initial incision, which is temporal. 
We just do the identical corneal incision there, and that's it. So I love toric IOLs too, but remember, they're for one or more diopters of astigmatism. Incisional approaches are best for low astigmatism, particularly in the USA, where we don't have the toric lenses to correct less than a diopter. Again, here's the patient at the end. We're going to do an LRI here. So fixation ring goes down. We line up where we want to place this. 500 micron depth blade. Goes all the way down. Stays perpendicular to the corneal surface. And we just drag it along there to create about one clock hour. 30 degrees worth. Now, if you want, you can use fancy toys like this to make the incisions, but it really doesn't make a difference. The disposable LRI blade's pretty good. So the incisional astigmatic treatment is the best and only option for 0.7 diopters or less of corneal astigmatism in the USA. So thank you for your attention. I sincerely appreciate it. All my videos are available on cataractcoach.com. Check it out. It's totally free. A new video every day. Cataractcoach.com. Paired phaco incisions to treat astigmatism. Now, there are a lot of pros here. It's very easy, no other instruments, it's fast, it's low cost. The cons are it's only one diopter of astigmatism, there are two potential leak sites, and there can be a variable response. There's a 20 year history of paired phaco incisions, but most studies are with larger incisions and they gave at least a diopter or more flattening. Keep in mind that superior incisions have more astigmatic effect than identical temporal ones. Closer to the visual axis, different corneal architecture. Let's show you a case here. This is operating temporally, so this patient has a steep axis at about 180. We'll make our main incision at the beginning of the case. At the end now, the eye well is in the bag. There's still viscoelastic in the eye. We'll put a little extra viscoelastic to keep the eye inflated. It's much easier to make this extra incision under viscoelastic. And then here we switch hands. Keratome in the left hand now, and we'll make a nice full thickness incision. There it is. There's a paired incision. Now you can take it viscoelastic. So against the rule of stigmatism, one incision causes about a quarter to half diopter of corneal flattening. And you all know that from your routine cases. But if you pair it with a second incision, now you're looking at about a half to one diopter of corneal flattening. More effect with a wider incision, a shorter tunnel length, and advanced age. Let's look at a patient now where I'm sitting superiorly. This is a patient who has a steep axis at about 90 degrees. So there's the main phaco incision. At the end of the case, eye wells in the bag, more viscoelastic to keep the anterior chamber inflated. And now switch hands will make the opposite full thickness incision inferiorly. So this patient has, with the rule of stigmatism, we operate on the steep axis, which is superior at about 90 and we make a paired incision there inferiorly. So again, with, with the rule of stigmatism, one phaco incision causes about a half or a little bit more diopters of corneal flattening. But when we pair it with a second incision, now we get about 0.75 to 1.25 diopters of corneal flattening. And again, more effect with a wider incision, shorter tunnel length and advanced age. We can also shift our position in order to access some of these um, axes. So looking at this patient here, we're operating temporally, I'm sitting temporally, but that incision's at about the 75 degree mark for with the rule of stigmatism. I just put my right hand way over to the side. And again, we're intentionally trying to have a relatively short tunnel length to have more astigmatic effect. Yes, we want the incision to seal well, but we also want it to have that astigmatic effect. And here I'll go almost all the way in, but not quite to try titrate the amount of astigmatic flattening. And we check at the end of the case. Remember, two incisions that have to be sealed up. Diamond keratomes work great. And these are my favorites. These are obviously sharper than steel blades. At the beginning of the case here, operating temporally, patient has against the rule of stigmatism at about the 15 degree meridian. So there we go. One incision at the end of the case, there's the second full thickness incision. Here are our results. Now, this is a small study. We had uh, about 20 patients in one group and 10 in the other. This is astigmatic effect of paired incisions that are 2.8 millimeters wide. On the left there, those are patients with against the rule, so steep at or about 180. And we got about 0.7 diopters of flattening. On the right there, those are patients that had with the rule astigmatism. And in that situation, 
those patients had about 0.9 diopters of flattening. So again, superior causes more flattening than operating temporally with identical incisions. There's also a little bit more variability in those patients that had with the rule astigmatism, so steep at 90. Wider incisions are gonna have more effect. So 2.8 is what we studied here. If you make 2.2 or 2.4, you may need to enlarge those to have greater astigmatic effect. The more central the incision is, the more effect it'll have. If you're at the clear cornea, great. At the limbal vessels, less effect. And then tunnel length, shorter tunnel length gives more effect. A very long tunnel length will give less astigmatic flattening. So things that are important to be titrated. If you're doing one or more of astigmatism, two diopters, three diopters, of course, use a toric lens. A toric lens is certainly more accurate than this, but it's also a lot more expensive, and that can be an issue. So I'll show you one more case here at the end. Again, operating temporally, this patient has against the rule astigmatism, steep at about the 180 um, axis. There's the first incision. At the end of the case, IOL in the bag, extra viscoelastic has been placed and we'll make the opposing full thickness incision with the hands uh, switched. So now keratome in the left hand. So here's our nomogram for paired 2.8 millimeter phaco incisions. So important to remember this is 2.8. If it's against the rule, in other words, that the 180 meridian or thereabouts, it'll be about 0.7 diopters of flattening for paired incisions. If it's with the rule, that's on or about the 90 degree axis, you'll get about one diopter of flattening with those paired 2.8 millimeter incisions. Again, keep in mind there's more effect with a shorter tunnel length, a more central incision, and then also advanced age. All those play a role. So I encourage you to try this in your own patients and add it to your toolbox. Thank you for watching. CataractCoach.com, angle alpha and angle kappa. Why these two important measurements can help you center your diffractive IOLs. Step one is a good capsular axis. We're going to use those forceps to measure. We want a five millimeter diameter capsular axis, and we want it well centered in this eye. The three lights on the middle of the cornea, that's the Purkinje image from the anterior corneal surface. And we can center up this capsular axis with respect to that. So important to have a good centered capsorexis. It has to be round and intact, but it should also be the right size and also centered over the visual axis. So now let's go to the cataract part. Let's speed it up to 10 times normal so we can get through the whole case. We're gonna do a very traditional chop in the bag technique. Here's a vertical chop and we'll aspirate out the lens material. Let's do a little review here. So this is the patient's right eye. We've reoriented the picture so that the superior part of the eye is at the top of your screen. So the big green circle, that's based on the limbus. We're tracing the limbus, and the green dot in the middle is the optical center of the cornea based on that. The next one here, the blue circle is outlining the pupil, and the geometric center of that is the blue dot. That's the pupil center. The visual axis is that yellow dot, and we determine that with a coaxial light. So the patient is fixating on our light, and that Purkinje image, the reflection off the anterior cornea, that shows us where the patient's visual axis is. We put all three together on the same page. You can see for this patient, the optical center in green, the pupil center in blue, and the visual axis in yellow they're all nearly in the same position. They're very close to each other, within 0.1 or 2.2 millimeters of each other. And that's super important, because now we can center up this diffractive IOL and put that center echelette right in the center of all those three, and this patient's gonna have fantastic performance from that lens. Let's look at a different eye. This is an, another patient, a left eye, and in this situation, we see that the optical center in green is not the same as the pupil center in blue, and the visual axis is even more nasal to that. So in this patient, there's quite a space between the visual axis, the pupil center, and the optical center. So if you were gonna put a diffractive uh, lens in this eye, well, where do you center the rings? And this is a patient where a diffractive lens 
may not be the best choice. So let's look at angle alpha. Angle alpha is the space between the visual axis and the optical center. So shown there. Angle kappa is the space between the visual axis and the pupil center. So we're used to looking at this view, which is a surgeon's type view. But here we can measure things in millimeters. It's hard to figure out what the angle is and why these things have an angle associated with them. Look at the anatomy of the eye in this picture. Now we understand where the angle is. Let's start off by first looking at the green, the optical center. So the green line that goes from temporal to nasal, that's showing us the limbus to limbus. And the center of that is marked with the green dot. And you can see that's the optical axis. And that doesn't necessarily fall right on the fovea. The visual axis in yellow is right on the fovea. The patient's fixating on that light. To fixate or foveate on that light means we're going to line up that Purkinje reflection exactly in the visual axis. And then in blue, that dot is the center of the pupil, the anatomic pupil. So looking here, angle alpha, now we understand, is the angle between the optical axis and the visual axis. And now in purple, angle kappa is the angle between the pupillary axis and the visual axis. And it's very important to understand these concepts when we're doing surgery. Now let's get back to the surgery. We're implanting our trifocal IOL here with diffractive rings, and that's going in the capsule bag. We'll center up the lens. We sometimes like to orient the lens so the haptics are superior and inferior. And the reason is then we can push the lens slightly towards the nasal aspect, which is typically where we end up finding the exact centration. So let's go behind the IOL to remove viscoelastic. Very important to get all those viscoelastic out. Otherwise, the IOL can slip. The viscoelastic will act as a lubricant. So remove all that viscoelastic so the IOL optic will stay where we put it. And now we center it up. We're looking at the two Purkinje images. The Purkinje image on the left, which is wider, that's the first Purkinje image off the center of the anterior cornea. The fourth Purkinje image is the one that has a slight yellow tint and it's inverted, and that's from the back surface of the IOL optic. It has the slight yellow tint because the IOL has a very slight yellow tint to it. So now when we center these up, we can have both of those Purkinje images overlapping each other to avoid parallax, and we line up both of those in the center of this diffractive optic. And in this patient situation, the pupillary center is nearly identical to the visual axis. So sealing up the incision here. Now the patient is not looking at the light, so we have some parallax. You see the separation of the two Purkinje images. We'll sweep the anterior chamber and get the pressure normal, and now we'll center the eye, and there we see those uh, Purkinje images beautifully overlapped in the center of the optic. So keep in mind angle kappa and angle alpha when you're implanting any IOL that has diffractive optics. Also, check out cataractcoach.com. I know you love this video. You can actually get all the still pictures from this video on the cataractcoach.com website. Plus, sign up for a free daily email, and we'll send you a great video like this to your inbox every single day. Thanks for watching. Cataractcoach.com, pearls for presbyopic IOLs. Now, these are great lenses, but we've got a few pearls here. Number one, achieve the target of Plano. Now, the patients are not going to be happy if you don't hit that post-op target of Plano. So this is where the trifocal lenses, where you're getting a great range of vision, you really have to hit the target. If you end up minus a half, the patient's not going to be happy. They're going to say, distance vision is too blurry. I don't like it. And you don't want to deal with that kind of grief. So you really need to hit that Plano target for these patients. So you look at the lens calcs. Yeah, of course, ideal is perfect Plano. That's beautiful. If you can get absolute Plano, zero, zero, zero across the board, that's fantastic. But even being a half diopter hyperopic is better than ending up myopic. So don't let these patients end up minus a half or more. 
Now they'll be so happy. And the patients say, thank you. I'm so happy with the new vision. So truly, a lot of the happiness depends on achieving that goal. And there this patient is with his granddaughter who's happy. Now, of course, the cataract surgery part's relatively routine, even in this presbyopic lenses. You can see from the sped up video, we can chop, chop that cataract up, remove it from the eye pretty easily. There's the epinuclear shell. We'll clean this up and get the new uh, lens in. There's the lens. We've got a nice trifocal lens here. And these trifocal lenses are now becoming the most standardly used presbyopic eye in our practice. Now, we also do have extended up the focus lenses, but those don't truly give that full range of vision. You really need to use a trifocal lens if you are going to achieve the distance, intermediate, and near vision in both eyes. And that's an important consideration. So we're using trifocal lenses here as our gold standard. And in our practice, again, it's not a huge percent of the patients, but it's significant. And here at the end, an LRI, make sure you knock down that astigmatism as well, even a haptopter. Number two, center the eye well precisely. Are you looking at what is the optical center, the pupil center, the visual axis? There's the angle alpha between the visual axis and the optical center. You have to know what angle alpha is. So you can see on this patient, is it reasonable? That's pretty good. But you also want to look at other things. Angle kappa, the distance between the visual axis and the pupil center. So make sure the angle kappa is not too big. So all these things can be analyzed ahead of time, and there are a lot of machines in your clinic that will do this on an automated basis. So choose patients with a very small angle alpha and small angle kappa. Therefore, when you line up that presbyopic lens and those concentric rings, they're beautifully centered. So here's a good example, a great candidate. All three of these, optical center, pupil center, visual axis, they're almost identical. They're almost in the same position right there in the center. And this patient, therefore, will have a beautiful outcome in this. And this patient is happy now. Look, I have a pretty wide range of vision without glasses. Such a happy patient. So trifocal patients can be uh, very happy. And they say also the night vision glen halos, they're not too bad. Very acceptable. Pearl, pearl three, under promise and over deliver. So patients like this complain, oh, I can't see well for some. It's time for some Google homework. And they figure what they want. They want perfect vision and extra vision. And if you're young again, no, 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 no. You can't have that. No matter what you pay. You can't have that. So I say, no, let's have a compromise. We'll do a diffractive lens, a trifocal lens, and you can, you, you can live with these compromises. Now, I do show them this image quality in, um, simulation. And you can see there's a mild quality between, and sunlight here between a monofocal and trifocal. Remember, trifocal lenses, of course, they are making a compromise. So I want to show this to a patient and say, look, there can be a difference here in the image quality. Now, in a bright sunlight image like this, it's not much difference. In some shade, maybe a little more difference, but still pretty good in both images. But I want to under-promise for the patient and then over-deliver. But yes, for sure, trifocal lens implants, as you can see here, do cause a little bit of image quality issues. You can't have everything. You can't cheat physics. So especially at nighttime, you can see there's less contrast with a trifocal lens compared to a monofocal lens. In both images, you can see perfectly fine. And certainly both are much better than the cataract that the patient already has. So that's a good thing for the patient. They can be very happy. So again, I want to really under-promise this. And I'll show simulations too of the nighttime vision, a monofocal appearance of oncoming car headlights versus a trifocal. And you see there certainly are some halos or rings around the trifocal lens implant images. And that's to be expected. That's how the lens works. You can't turn off the diffractive rings. At nighttime, those rings are there permanently. So by showing this image, patients usually say to me, oh, it's really not that bad. Now, the glare and halos at night tend to diminish with time. So after three, four, five, six months, these patients have a lot better night vision because the brain naturally filters these things out. It's the nature of we call neuroadaptation. Or think of it this way. The people who live, live near the airport, they never hear the planes flying, do they? But you do. So look at an example here. Here's near vision without glasses. So the trifocal lens certainly gives better near vision than a monofocal lens set for Plano. But what happens if you put on your glasses? So you have to explain that near vision with glasses, if you use a monofocal lens, is going to be even better. And here's an example there showing you that there's near vision with glasses. Now you can see the image on the left, the monofocal lens set for Plano, but you're wearing near glasses plus 250 readers is actually better 
than the opposite side, which is the trifocal lens of blindness. Same with the phone here. You have a cell phone without glasses, so certainly if you have a trifocal lens, you can see everything there. You can read it, and you can see all the small print, but the cell phone with glasses with a monofocal lens is even a bit sharper, a little bit better contrast. And that's to be expected there. So that's pearl number three. Number four, only normal corneas and retinas. So when you're putting these in, who's the ideal trifocal patient? It's the one where the patient has a normal healthy cornea. That also means a good, healthy, normal tear film, as well as a normal retina. So here's the page. You can see toric lens and hyperopic lens, so 27 diopters. So this patient is already starting off as hyperopic with significant astigmatism, but luckily a totally normal cornea, a good tear film, and a nice, healthy, normal retina. As a result, this patient will be absolutely thrilled with this trifocal lens. Because again, this patient also had a significant cataract. So we fixed the cataract, the hyperopia, the astigmatism, all in one setting, also addressing the presbyopia. And you can see this lens goes in the bag quite nicely, and the patient will have a beautiful outcome here. So again, look at your patients carefully. When you look at the corneas, make sure they're totally normal. No irregularities. Make sure any astigmatism in this cornea is completely symmetric. Here's a patient with a little Irish prolapse. Guess what? Remember, there's a 27 and a half diopter lens. This is a shallow eye, shallow AC, small eye, highly hyperopic patient. This patient, again, is going to be thrilled. That's why we had the Irish prolapse. This is an unusual eye. Look how big that 6 millimeter optic looks inside this eye. So this patient not only had a normal tear film and normal cornea, the patient had a nice regular and symmetric degree of astigmatism. Patient also has a normal macula. This is not a great lens for someone who has optic nerve issues like glaucoma and visual field loss. This is not a great lens for someone who has maculopathy, whether that's a macular degeneration and a severe epiretinal membrane, a macular pucker, a macular hole, etc., Probably not a great choice in someone who has bad diabetic retinopathy. So what you want to do is choose the appropriate patients here. And a patient like this is going to be absolutely thrilled. Be careful of the patients who are low myopes. The patients with minus two myope who now takes off glasses to read up close. And then with glasses for far away vision may not be entirely pleased compared to this patient who's highly hyperopic. And again, achieving that nice centration of the lens, these patients can have a very beautiful outcome. And my last pearl here is, you got to give time for neuroadaptation, at least six months. So here's a patient again, myopic eye this time, 15 diopter lens, trifocal lens. Now these patients, I always tell them, it's like living near the airport. The patients who live near the airport, they don't actually hear the airplanes landing or taking off. But when you go to their house, you may be startled. And it's because they've neuroadapted to living there. And so their brain naturally just filters out those incredibly loud sounds of those airplanes. So same with neuroadaptation for these trifocal lenses. At the six-month mark, these patients are really not bothered by the nighttime halo or glare. And they see very well. And they're very happy. 99% of them would choose this lens again. I do explain that there's a visual range with each lens type. And you can see in this graph here... I dispel the idea that you cannot be 25 years old again. That's that green line at the very top. We all wish we could be young again, 25 years old, amazing vision from near to far and perfect night vision. And that's going to happen. The yellow line is what a distance vision lens implant is. So good night vision. But again, there's no significant near vision. And then if you look at the blue or the orange lines, those are with a, a bifocal lens. You can see there. Or the, uh, the blue is a trifocal lens. So yes, a pretty good range there. The vision's clear, but not perfect. So these patients then are going to be very happy. CataractCoach.com. Refractive lens exchange pearls. So here are the keys to success for these refractive lens exchange patients. Now, the first concept is what is the patient's preoperative refractive issue? Certainly you're not going to do surgery on a 25-year-old who's plain old refractive error and a tremendous amount of accommodation. So there are a couple of groups of patients in which you have to be extra careful. Number one, the plano presbyopes. 55-year-old person, for example, sharp 20-20 distance vision without glasses, and just needs glass to see up close. The challenge you're gonna have there is, our presbyopic solutions may not give the image quality that the patient desires. 
If you're going to do something here, you may want to not touch the plano dominant eye, leave that for distance, and then do a procedure, either LASIK, perhaps an IOL, for the non-dominant eye to dial in some near vision. Examples like this case, this is using an extended depth of focus lens and aiming for a little bit of a myopic target in order to give some reading vision. The second group of patients where you have to be very careful are the low myopes. You ever had that patient who's a low myope, but also a presbyope, a 50 year old who's minus two and says, listen, my near vision's great. Just fix my distance vision with laser. Well, you and I both know that's not possible to fix presbyopia and give the patient the same vision that they're used to. So in those situations, you want to be very careful. Now, what are the refractive patients that have a beautiful outcome with RLE? Those tend to be the ones who start off hyperopic. If the patient's hyperopic to begin with, let's say a plus two or three or even plus four or five for distance vision, and then they've got readers on top of that because they're presbyopic, those patients are going to be very appreciative. Even then, keep in mind, there is a little bit of an image quality loss when we put in lenses that are going to split or spread the light. Think of it this way. The light energy if you, that goes in the eye, if you focus all those photons on one range, like distance vision, image quality is really good. And that's what the patient is doing now, and just the patient using glasses to shift that focus to near vision, etc., if you get that same amount of light energy and you give most of it for distance vision and then some of it for the intermediate range, like an EDOF or extended depth of focus lens, that's still pretty good image quality, but it's a little bit less than a monofocal, especially at night when the light energy is limited. And finally, think of a trifocal lens. The total amount of incoming light energy is still the same, but now you're splitting up into three ranges, approximately equal for distance and then equal for intermediate equal for near. And so again, in situations where there's less than abundant light, such as dim lighting or nighttime vision, there's going to be some sort of compromise. In addition, those diffracted rings will cause the patient to see rings around lights at night, the haloing effect. So you can certainly do the surgery still those patients. The key is to set reasonable expectations. Now, another important concept you've seen here in this video is to do a meticulous surgery. Notice how at the beginning of the case, I got the nucleus up out of the capsule bag. You cannot risk a ruptured capsule or damaged lens uh, capsule in a patient who's paying for refractive lens exchange. You really have to be able to deliver a beautiful incision, a predictable refractive outcome, a beautiful capsular excess, and get that lens beautifully centered in the visual axis. So again, in the case shown here, this is a patient who's getting a refractive lens exchange in the non-dominant eye and aiming for a little bit of mild myopia and using an extended depth of focus lens in order to give a reasonable range for that intermediate vision. So this patient is, in essence, opting for monovision. This patient is probably mid to late 50s and a plano presbyope, so sharp distance vision. We're not touching the dominant eye, which we're leaving since it sees 20-20 distance great. It just has no reasonable near vision. Now, this non-dominant eye with the extended depth of focus lens, we're going to be able to dial in a reasonable amount of near vision. Now, keep in mind, what's the range here? This patient wants to, be see, wants to be able to see the computer screen and maybe the cell phone screen and do some reading at a normal distance of, let's say, 40 centimeters away from the face. And that's a, somewhere in the range of, let's say, 16 inches or so. And that's reasonable. And so for that, for this lens, the EDOF lens gives about one and a half diopters of range um, and or depth of focus, maybe aiming for a post-op refractive result of minus 75, minus one, would give a very nice wide range of vision for the near zone for this patient. And so as a result, this patient would then have monovision. The right eye is plano with a human crystalline lens, and then the left eye is about minus one with an EDOF lens like this. And then the patient's able to read pretty well and is pretty happy. You see at the end of the case here, look at that centration. You can see the rings or the, the central zone, I'd rather, of that EDOF is beautifully centered in the Purkinje images. We put some triamcinolone inside the eye to help quell inflammation. We also put some moxifloxin. The patient has a little bit of astigmatism in the cornea. We're going to address that with just a very small, limbal, relaxed incision. And that's the end of the case. So a lot of consideration to keep in mind when you do cataract surgery or refractive lens exchange surgery, more precisely, for these patients with refractive errors.